you all very much. And if we could start the evening session with um, Keep Our Assets Canterbury, um, Stephen Howard and Murray Horton. Oh, it was just a, it was just a guess. Just a guess, Leanne, isn't it? Colour I mean, my eyesight is bad, but not that bad. <laughs> Welcome. Thank you. So, Māori ora ki te rangi, Māori ora ki te whenua, Māori ora ki te ao whānui. Um, e haro tako hotoa, he take tahi, he take tini. Um, tēnā koutou te rōpū whakahari o auto tahi. Um, my name's Stephen Howard, this is Murray Horton. We represent um, Keep Our Assets Canterbury. I'll let Murray start. He's about to run you through a few points. Just some key points. You've got our submission. There's six of them. They're very brief. Selling the council's commercial assets will only be the beginning, not the end. Next in line will be social housing. Indeed, that's already started. And then water, parks, libraries, roads, and the whole gamut of council assets and services. The council is on a slippery slope to flogging off the lot, not just all the commercial assets, but everything. Two, it is not a question of asset sales or rates increases. According to the council's own material, it is a question of asset sales and rates increases. Of course, when rates inevitably go up and up, the council won't have the income stream from those flogged off commercial assets to keep those rates increases to a tolerable level, which is precisely the rationale for them being owned by the council. Three, who will buy these assets? It won't be the mythical quote-unquote mum and dad. Inevitably, it will be transnational corporations, and the people of Christchurch will lose control over our own destiny as a cohesive portfolio of publicly owned and hugely valuable assets will be broken up and sold off to a collection of different transnational corporations whose top priority is securing the highest profits and biggest returns for their shareholders. Four, the council in Christchurch will lose the ability to build in resilience to the city's vital infrastructure. Quote, Orion chairman Craig Boyce said city ownership of Orion had allowed the company to do some things that private owners would probably not have done, <laughs> such as earthquake strengthening from the 1990s. Direct quote from Boyce, this had a huge effect to get the power on quickly. With regard to debate over city ownership of certain assets, Boyce backs Orion stating city owned. Direct quote, utilities providing essential services, particularly where they are seen as a natural monopoly, I think they should stay with the community. Unquote. Press 12 7 12. Contrast publicly owned Orion's proud record of acting in the public interest with the shabby record of the overseas owned Wellington Electricity. Five, what's the rush and panic? The Auckland City Council website makes a valid point, quote, it is fair to spread the cost over the generations who will use the assets, unquote. The Christchurch City Council is being stampeded by debt hysteria, shock doctrine and disaster capitalism into making hasty and irrevocable decisions that will have permanent negative effects on the people of Christchurch. Six, and final, democracy is our greatest asset and the one which is under greatest threat in Christchurch. No councillor campaigned in the 2030 election on a platform of selling assets. Those who now call for asset sales should resign and seek a mandate on that policy at the next local body election. Thank you very much. And I'll take up that question of democracy. Um, first of all, let me congratulate the People's Choice councillors for coming up with an alternative. Um, it's interesting to see that they can do that when we have been told there are no alternatives. Tina has always been a threat against democracy. Tina means there is no alternative. And to come up and say Tina is the old thatch right ploy of suggesting there are no alternatives. If this council was really concerned with maintaining democracy, they would have made sure their bureaucrats delivered some alternatives. Secondly, <coughs> We can see from the Cameron Report's terms of reference that the decision to sell was made before commissioning the Cameron Partnership. And we have serious concerns about the Cameron Partnership because they have been involved in dodgy asset sales before, Telecom for instance. They're not ashamed of this. They actually boast about it on their website. The Council has a large bureaucracy they have access to all the figures. They should be able to come up with some alternative. The four options given in the, in the tenure plan document are not really that much options. They all involve selling assets. And once more, going back to the slippery slopes, once you start selling assets, they continue. Cameron Partners mentioned the sale of water assets. Page 46, I think it is. 47. 47, is it? Sorry, I mean. 
So we're happy to take questions or discussion. Very good. Questions? Yanni. Thank you. Thank you for submission. Just in point seven, you talked through the, the cost share, and I'm just wondering if you could just elaborate on that, um, just just in terms of the public process and also what commitments or <coughs> lack of commitments that, that has in it. You mean the the, the, the sixty forty cost share split with the with the central government? Well, I think um, events are running away with, from the council a bit at the moment because we see that um, CCDU and Sarah are making decisions about running out the, the anchor projects now. So it's very clear from looking at the various bodies involved, like Higgs and CCDU and CERA, that the council's got a very small point in this process. And so the council's not making the decisions. The, count, the central government's making the decisions. The costs are going up. The central government should be meeting that responsibility. I would say that I was impressed with Councillor Manji's appearance on Campbell Live on Friday night, and I, my message to Councillor Manji would come back from the dark side. And it's more light over this side. And so, obviously, good to see you having a rethink. <laughs> <laughs> Since you've I got have to allow my Rick name. The <clears throat> floor. Okay. Um, I mean, here's a question for you. Right. So, you say in 2015 the council expects to receive $46 million. That's the dividend from CCHL. Uh, which is on an asset base of around $1.6 billion. So that's less than 3%. You then say, if the assets were sold, which is not what we're intending to do, um, this income is lost to the council forever, and we will all suffer from heavy rate rises. Would you like to explain that sentence? Because it's completely untrue. So, Well, if it's, comple if it's completely that? untrue, then um, the Cameron report is also untrue, because the Cameron report makes it very clear that holding these assets has kept our rates down mm. compared to comparable um, city councils. Yeah, but what you don't understand is that there's an opportunity cost. So we receive the capital. Oh. It's what we do with that capital <laughs> that's the issue. I, I do understand opportunity costs. Um, but what you should be actually saying is what you're spending that money on is the well, issue. What? I, could, I, could, I could stake that money in, in the bank, in the market. You could earn 5 or 6% a year. You'd actually be making money. What we see is when councils borrow because they're a secure risk, they can borrow a lot lower than the average mother and father borrower can. What we also see is in PPPs, which I define as a social a, a service paid for by a central or local government, but delivered by a private entity, whether it's an NGO or a corporate entity. What we see is the people that end up making the decisions in those situations are the the, cap, the people that supply the capital, the money. Are you not answering the question? The, yeah, I am. And so what we see is costs increase hugely. Simply holding those assets keeps costs down. Does it? Well, that's the evidence of all the PPP reading I did at the beginning and of last PPPs, year. I'm talking about your statement around <coughs> the fact that we will suffer from heavy rates rises. Yes, we will suffer from heavy rates rises because well, the cost of delivering those services where's will increase because the corporates are there to make a profit. Uh, but that's that's quite simple economics, about, right? You're talking about the dividend loss and oh, you're not, not we, realising that there's a capital return. So it depends what we do with that capital. That's our capital. We, there, there's, there's a dividend loss. So in that case, you might argue what that dividend is. We're told that it's been pretty good in most cases, except for city care, which seems to have a, an empire building... You've said an empire build, an empire building. 3% return. I'm asking you to justify your statement. You're not able to do so. I think I have done so, Raj. The other return we get is the return that Orion um, chairman dis describes, which is resilience. That's a very important mm. return. And most of the people that Christchurch lived through the earthquakes, um, earthquakes and had their power back on very quickly would say that's the most important return from those assets. Just to address your point, at 7 o'clock tonight there's a public meeting at the netball courts with two academics from Wellington talking I know, about... I know, so, I've to... mentioned it before and I said I was very frustrated that it was held on a night while we're having hearings into the LTP because <laughs> I'd personally like to go and hear the yeah, Dick Weary and um, Dick Weary uh, Paul... And, uh, um, Harris, ex -CTA. Peter Harris. Peter Harris. Yeah. And they actually compare the increase in uh, price of uh, still publicly owned Wellington water, 
since the 1990s, which is something like 17.5%, compared to the increase in rates with the now privately, in fact, overseas-owned Wellington Electricity. Which and is we have the problem, but Ryan is regulated. The price, path, the price path is regulated and set by the Commerce Commission. So it doesn't matter who owns it. Yes, I know, but you, the, the comparison Thank isn't you. the right comparison. What you've got to do well, is compare apples with apples, which is electricity with electricity. So did the privatisation the of Wellington, because um, I actually think you can make the case that the privatisation yeah. of Wellington meant that they didn't invest in resilience, right. as, as Orion did. Yep. Um, but the question is, is did its p prices increase out of line with the rest of power prices, because I don't think that is the case. All, all the, all the um, research I've read on BPPs, and it's a PPP situation. No, it's not. It's not. They're, they're, it is a PPP situation it. under the definition I gave you, which was a public service paid for or led by a, a local or central government and, and delivered by a, a local... Well, that's not yeah, what the, we're not talking so, about. So, so every, in every situation, there are, where there's been cost reductions, they have come in wages. And in, in situations where such things... Sorry, I was, I was actually trying to be on your side here. <laughs> I think you've got a really good argument around the resilience question. But to compare water with electricity distribution, it doesn't make sense to me. I mean, did, did, other electri did, did Orion's prices increase at a lower rate because it hadn't been privatised. The point that Raf's making is that it's a regulated price path. And in fact, Orion has had to go back to the Commerce Commission to reset its price path on the basis that it needs to restore resilience to its network. And that's not surprising after a major earthquake. No, but that's my point, is that it's a regulated monopoly. monopoly. So the argument around resilience is a really powerful one. I haven't heard the price um, differential made out. <coughs> I haven't heard that argument made out. The price differential is always... There's always going to be pressure on prices when there's monopoly. I think we both accept that. I think Raj would accept that too. You can regulate, but the regulations are always under threat by governments that are committed to neoliberal... No, but that's why we have a Commerce Commission. You know, <laughs> the com the, the Commerce the... Commission is not independent. It's, it's built with people who are ideologically <laughs> driven along one particular line. It has a public role. But anyway, yes. that, yeah. that, um, are there other questions? Yeah. Phil? One um, reference you make to on page one to one for us is around the numbers is what um, in the Cameron report are referred to as risks, and you're already saying, look, they should only be seen as uncertainties. Just well, it's, explain not on, it's not only Phil. Um, an economics risk normally means a set of events that fall within a, a normal probability curve, and you can sort of work on them. Uncertainties are just that. And it seems that most of the uncertainty involved here is uncertainty in how central government's going to make decisions and, and whether they're going to live up to their, their um, commitments to fund. And the other uncertainty is, seems to be the costs, which are driven up by the cosy monopoly that's been set up under Sarah with the construction companies. And the third uncertainty is the insurance uncertainty. But... Events have been changing very quickly, and I'm not exactly sure where the insurance uncertainty is at the moment. But those two, and the one uncertainty that if the council wanted to be really democratic, they would address is that uncertainty of the, of the cost share agreement with central government, and they should be coming out and telling the people of Christchurch, this is where the major uncertainty is, this is where we're being let down, you, the people of Christchurch, need to know that. And we're not being, we're not seeing that statement coming from the council. Stephen, what if, what if it turns out that the cost share agreement um, calculations were based on a, on an assumption that didn't turn out to be um, sustainable at law? Because the government always funds after an earthquake. They always pay 60 percent towards the um, horizontal infrastructure, and they pay 83 percent, as it was in this case, for the roads. Um, but what if it turned out that they didn't owe us any more and we still have to repair our land drainage recovery programme, we still have to, you know, and that's, that's what I want people to focus on is, is what if that is the case? Because if that's the case, 
then we actually have to construct a new relationship with central government about how we're going to fund what is a substantial amount of um, work that still needs to be done. And selling off assets is not the way to fund it. These assets are the toolbox, not the family jewels. Yeah, but we, if, we, we lose too much. So you're saying much. that central government should pay more than they contracted to, to pay if it turns out they've already paid their share? We don't know what the central government has paid. The cost share agreement seems to be fairly... Difficult it, it will be all out in the open very, very soon, well, I assure you. It should have been out in the open before these hearings started. We've then. only just finished the independent review. Well, the obvious answer is to, as the People's Choice have done, delay and defer. Yes. So we clock. delay fixing the footpaths over yeah. in east of Christchurch. We delay fixing the roads so that they continue to transfer the cost to the people who are driving their cars in those areas. I mean... Where is it OK to delay? Well, Leave aside the anchor projects. Pretend right. that none of them are there. Well, Just focus on what are the priorities to get our to, city back on its feet. The, the first priority is to, to make good decisions. There is a geographer at Canterbury University called Deirdre Hart. She, in a public lecture at the university, said very, very clearly, in her opinion, the... Some of the decisions as to which areas should be red zoned early on in the piece were rushed. Yeah. Rushing does not lead to good decisions. And sometimes the extra costs of the poor decisions are just what you have to wear to make a good decision. I agree. So we can take some items off our capital programme while we actually analyse the situation. We're absolutely committed to doing that. We've already said that publicly. But the issue that I'm trying to work out is, is that if there is a work programme to do and there is no further commitment from central government, how do we pay for it? Well, we have spoken about borrowing in our submissions. And it's a point I keep making to people I've spoken to, is that when most of us in our 30s these days, it used to be in our 20s, <laughs> buy our first home, we are quite happy to borrow six or seven times our annual income. There is an the local government funded there, 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 there is an artificial, <laughs> a completely arbitrary and artificial cap on, on borrowing... So you from just the, say reset the cap with I, the LGFA? The, when you briefed us at the Cameron, when the Cameron report was released, we put that question to you there. Yep. And you indicated that you weren't even going to go there because if you did, Auckland would also want to go there, which is not a valid argument because Auckland... Well, has a growth have a problem. different set of rules. A, a growth problem. They're special. They've got what could be seen as a beneficial problem. They're also able to borrow offshore. Whereas we, whereas we have suffered a severe earthquake, and it's only reasonable to lift that cap and allow future generations to pay for some of the benefits they're going to. Or negotiate an alternative um, debt profile through some other means. Well, I, I, my understanding is a covenant with a local government funding authority is fairly firm, and, and you'd have to negotiate with them and central government to move that anyway. Or we could opt out of it. Anyway, thank you very much. It's, um, we've been looking forward to hearing from you, and uh, I hope that the meeting goes well tonight. And uh, thank you very much for holding dear to um, holding dear. your principles. Thank you very much. Good night. Thank you. Now, Sam...